rockets, satellites, space probes, and space stations all have one thing in common. They need to move around in space using some form of propulsion. What are the pros and cons of different propulsion systems, and how do we engineer propulsion systems at Astronus? What are the physics principles that govern the way we move through the universe? And what could the future of propulsion technology hold? In this video, we're going to break down the basics of space propulsion. Space propulsion 101, if you will. So let's start with the fundamentals. Objects in motion will stay in motion. Objects at rest will stay at rest unless acted upon by an outside force. We want to take this force that we've created by accelerating mass out of the space and react that against the spacecraft. Force equals mass times acceleration. So we have mass, our rocket propellant, and we need to accelerate it really quickly in order to produce thrust or force. So by taking that mass and throwing it out into space, we can throw our spacecraft in the opposite direction. For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. If you're expelling mass out of one end, the opposite reaction will move the satellite the other direction. In space, it's a little easier because we don't have resistance to movement, because we don't have an atmosphere to deal with, and we only have gravitational forces from the planets that affect the way we move in space. Thrust is mass flow rate times the exhaust velocity. The goal with the propulsion system is to push mass as hard as you can to get the spacecraft to move in the opposite direction. You first want to consider the mass of your spacecraft. From there, you want to decide on the amount of thrust required in order to complete the mission. And the thrust required will drive the size of the propulsion system, and you can kind of go through this iterative loop. The rocket equation is super important. I don't deal with it a lot at like the face-to-face -face level, but it's just because a lot of the tools that I use have that equation embedded into them, and I use it literally on every flight. So as you consume propellant to accelerate your vehicle, you're actually reducing the mass of that vehicle by consuming that propellant. The rocket equation ties those two things together where we can calculate exactly how much movement or delta change in our velocity we can create by producing a consistent force even while the mass of the object we're moving is decreasing. ISP, or specific impulse, tells us what we're going to get out of the propellant that we load. It's essentially a measurement of efficiency. We measure specific impulse in seconds. If you have one kilogram of propellant and your system is, say, getting 300 seconds of, of specific impulse, then that one kilogram of propellant can produce one kilogram of thrust for 300 seconds. Simply to get to space, you have to have a thrust to weight ratio greater than one. You have to be able to rise against the force of gravity. So the only option currently available to us is chemical rockets. We take some chemical and we burn it or we react it to create hot gases that we can then accelerate behind us and we can get our force to move forward. There's solid rocket propulsion, which you'll see in everything from solid rocket motors students use to launch amateur rockets to something huge like the space shuttle boosters. A solid rocket motor consists of just a fuel, like a monolithic fuel, then it burns and you cannot shut it off. And that is like the big headline about solid rocket motors. What it does lack in precision, it gains you in simplicity. Typically what we see is like a rubber type of sludge that gets hardened into a shape and then that shape and the diameter and the length of it determines how long it burns. I have landed a model rocket using a solid motor. I found out a way that you could throttle solid motors in a sort of brute force method just clamping arms over the output of the exhaust so that the exhaust all goes out the side instead of coming out the back. Through that method, I was able to propulsively land a model rocket. I am not really sure that that technique scales up very well, but it was a fun experiment. There's also liquid chemical propulsion. The advantage of liquid propulsion systems is that they're very easy to control. You can turn them on and off by stopping and allowing the flow of the liquid to the thrusters. There's monopropellant and bipropellant systems. Bipropellant system has two propellants. Typically, they react on contact. A monoprop system only has one propellant that offers the advantage of being much simpler than a bipropellant system. Basically, you have half of all of the components that a bipropellant system would have. Once you're in space, you are on a free orbit. You're not going to fall down back to Earth, so you can take your time. 
That's where low thrust systems work, where you can have a very small thruster and therefore you're not spending much of your mass budget on that tiny thruster, or you can use electric systems. You actually take a noble gas, you ionize it, and then you accelerate those ions out into space using an electric field. Electric propulsion is actually much more efficient than chemical propulsion, but requires very high power to produce that electric current to accelerate those ions. You're gonna get much better specific impulse. 10, 20, 30 times the specific impulse. The thrust is entirely dependent on how much power you can get into it and the noble gas that you'll ionize. Xenon is one option. That's possibly the most expensive, but because it's got the heaviest atomic mass, it gets the most thrust. But if you can make your engine work with, say, argon or krypton, then you can trade off lower cost on the propellant for lower thrust overall. Uh, Astronix designs its propulsion systems, I think, in a very unique way. We have a chemical propulsion system. So we have eight thrusters mounted on each corner of the satellite. We also have an electric propulsion system. That's a single hull thruster located on our launch interface panel. This gives us the opportunity to conduct different kinds of maneuvers. So if we want very quick maneuvers, that's a great opportunity to use chemical propulsion systems. But for long duration burns or for orbit rays, um, that's when you can use our electric propulsion system, which has a much higher ISB and therefore is more efficient when looking for those long duration, long time kind of burns. A big focus when you're designing or procuring a propulsion system is to focus on safety, number one, cost, manufacturability, and effectiveness in fulfilling your mission profile. Pressure and temperature are these like bread and butter variables that all propulsion engineers play with. The higher your pressure, the higher your thrust, the lower your pressure, the lower your thrust. Pressure plays a role in engine design and the way that we operate engines and that generally when you have higher pressures, so that could be feed system pressure or combustion pressure, you can generate higher forces. Higher pressure generally means higher mass flows. Higher mass flows means bigger M in your Newton's second law, which means that you can produce a bigger F, your force. Throughout the course of your mission, the pressure in your main tank depletes over time as you use and use more propellant. You want to make sure you take into account your blowdown curve over time so that even when your birds become less efficient because you have less pressure, uh, you can still achieve the maneuver you're looking for. Just like the amount of fuel that we launch with is the amount of fuel that we have for the whole mission, we also launch with a fixed amount of pressurization gas. We have to think really carefully about the amount of gas that we start with and the amount of gas that we'll end with and the, the related pressures. Anything involving nuclear brings a whole host of interesting problems. Space has a lot of ionizing radiation in it from cosmic rays, but that's nothing compared to a nuclear reactor throwing out neutron radiation at you. There's nuclear electric propulsion and nuclear thermal propulsion. And they're both different takes on what's a value more in a propulsion system, higher ISP versus higher thrust. One common method is use nuclear reactor to generate electricity for an electric propulsion system. There's definitely other interesting things going on. There's one example I've seen, and this one is a flat thruster, which is basically a layer of thorium. As it decays, it emits alpha particles. The study suggests you could get 180 kilometers per second of delta V out of this thing. Now, it never stops generating thrusts that it has very interesting navigational problems. Rotating detonation engines use continuous detonation waves in order to produce thrust. NASA released uh, new research on rotation detonation engines. It's an interesting way in order to generate more efficient uh, propulsion maneuvers. Solar sails are awesome. I get right on board with that. I love it for like really long-term missions. I think it's such an efficient way to do it. The photons bounce off of the sail and the reaction force is what creates thrust. So it's very, very low thrust, even lower thrust than electric propulsion systems, but it just continues to accelerate, just continues to get pushed over time. Listen, I, I never rule anything out. The idea is that by combining antimatter and matter, the energy released from annihilation could be used to propel a spacecraft. I think a single gram of antimatter is what? Is it uh, billions of dollars? Hold on, I wanna, can I look this up? Yeah. 2,700 trillion per gram. Uh, that's quite expensive. 
If someone can figure out how to do reactionless propulsion, that's awesome. I don't think it is within the realm of physics. There is a tremendous amount of money to be made if it is. For every type of propulsion system, the way that it is working is Newton's third law, right? So you throw stuff out the back of the rocket and that makes the rocket go forward. A reactionless propulsion system keeps all of your fuel or whatever you're using on board. You don't have to throw anything out the back. I'm highly skeptical of this, but uh, right now I think IVO have a, a test thruster in orbit using some property of quantizing inertia, which they think might work. Being able to move through space without having to have this huge amount of propellant would radically change the universe, but I, you know, I don't think that's there. I love the idea if you think of like space time as a piece of paper with all of these little dents on it, right? Where there's gravitational like wells. So Earth is a dent, the sun is a dent, other solar systems are a really, really big dent. What if you take that paper and you just fold it and then you make two dents, two black holes, and you go through them. I always like to think of that in terms of like futuristic travel stuff, faster than light travel. Easy as that, super easy.